Hey guys, Woodruff here. So we are on our last video of the semester. I'm sure I think I have like a clarification I need to make on one of my videos that I um, had typed something wrong. But aside from that, this will be my last video for the semester. And I am excited. It's not because I don't love to help you guys. I love to help you guys, but I also love sleeping. And I love having like hobbies and time for myself. And again, I've said this before in many videos, like I will go to the depths of the ocean. What, well, maybe not that, cause that's really scary. Um, but I will do many things to help nursing students, um, whatever I can do to help my students, I will. Um, but if I had a choice, I would much rather teach in person, do all this stuff in person than make videos, but I will continue to make them. I know they're helpful, um, so I will do them. But um, yes. Um, a little bit of a break. And then this summer, I'm um, going to be hopefully putting together some stuff. I'm going to try to do some videos, doing some worksheets and other things to help to kind of learn to bring concepts together and learn some alternative ways to study. So um, that will hopefully be coming at you sometime, but we'll see. Maybe I might actually take a semi break this summer. It's such a struggle bus when you have um, like a mix of like ADHD, but also like, you know, like a people pleaser, perfectionist, like every time I tell myself, yes, to be a better version of myself, I need to relax more. Um, but also then like, I'm not good at relaxing. Every time I try to relax, I just don't know what to do with myself. And I have all these things I want to do, like play video games, color, um, read books. But uh, yeah, I always end up being like, I should be doing something more productive. <laughs> so we'll see um, who wins this summer, my ego, or um, uh, when you gotta, maybe I'll finally learn how to relax this summer. So fingers crossed for me. Um, this is hopefully a good lesson to you too, because I'm sure a lot of nursing students, you guys experience the same thing, the guilt for doing nothing and feeling like you always have to do something. So make sure you're taking breaks and taking care of yourself. I'm going to, I'm going to be, a um, what is it? Um, I'm going to be the pot calling the kettle black. Um, even though I need the one, listen to these own, my own advice, make sure you're taking care of yourself. Anyway, Let's finish up this semester talking about BPH, also known as benign prosthetic hyperplasia. Um, so this is an enlargement of the prostate. And effectively, the big picture here is it's an enlargement of the prostate that leads to effectively an obstruction because it's so big that it limits your ability to um, have good urinary flow. Like it decreases literally the hole that um, urine is coming out of so that you can't have as good a flow. Uh, it's usually most commonly associated like that, like as you get older, there's like hormonal changes changes and things that get released that can lead you to having, um, um, you know, more problems with BPH and things like that. Um, and again, this is, uh, I should mention, prostates only live in people that have genetic, um, genetically or biological sex characteristics that are male. So if you have that, this is what would increase your risk, not necessarily. Um, so like females, we don't have prostates. Um, so um, needless to say, uh, possible causes again, I'll go back to like the older you get, the more at risk you are. And then hormonal changes that come with age too. There are other risk factors like obesity, a sedentary lifestyle, like lifestyle stuff, like smoking, alcohol consumption, um, er erectile dysfunction issues, diabetes, family history. And also if you intake high levels of red meat or animal fat. So what I would expect for this patient um, is that everything with urination and flow um, is commonly messed up. So they might have difficulty. Um, and I have the ones kind of like for UTI, I marked the ones that are most common. I also have the ones that I hear most common or see most common on exams and stuff. Um, it's all about flow issues. So it's um, it's usually what we call hesitancy, which is difficulty starting a dream a stream. Um, I, what do you call it? Apparently, I'm tired because I'm sitting there thinking, oh, dream, like fall asleep. <laughs> so yeah. Anyway, back to on on task. Um, difficulty starting a stream, like so hesitancy. So think like I'm hesitant to start my urinary stream, and that would make sense because again, there's this obstruction, this blockage, the smaller pee hole. Um, decreased flow. So because there's a smaller um, uh, circumference or ability to actually get uh, flow out, there's going to be a decreased flow. Um, as a whole, there's what's called intermittency, which means like sometimes they pee a little bit and then it stops. They pee a little bit more and then it go, and then it stops. So you may notice that. Um, and then the other hallmark is going to be nocturious. So these patients commonly wake up in the middle of the night and have to use the restroom. Um, also, urinary frequency is going to be a, um, a possibility for them. Painful urination, they might have dribbling or incontinence as well. Um, and they would have more of that like overflow incontinence that we talked about where their bladder gets full. You want to assess for urinary symptoms, any difficulty that they're having, really focus on the flow questions. Um, and then also want to assess for urinary retention because 
these patients literally have an obstruction to the place where they're supposed to get urine out. So they're more likely to retain urine or have urinary retention. So a lot of what you're going to see here is going to look like the urinary retention PowerPoint that I did. Um, so they're better if they have decreased urinary symptoms, they have adequate urine output, like no retention. Um, so think that like, you know, they would have a normal or an improved post void residual. Um, and then they're worse if they have increased or worsening urinary symptoms, decreased urinary output, or any sign of urinary retention, like increased PVR, um, or of course, if we actually feel like a palpable bladder, because the bladder normally should not be palpable, it should not be so big that you can feel it. Um, and then any signs of kidney disease or damage, because BPH can eventually lead, like you can have backflow and you can go into kidney failure, um, so keeping an eye on that. So diagnostic testing that we're going to do, um, we need to rule out cancer and infection. So um, we usually do a CBC and a biopsy because those could be other reasons. You could have prostate cancer versus or prostatitis, um, things like that. So we want to rule those out. Um, they can do a digital rectal exam, which is every uh, man's favorite test where they tell them to bend over and cough and stick a finger up. And because that's the only place you can really feel the prostate is through the rectum. Um, and then we can also measure... Um, prostate damage with a PSA. And usually a PSA will be mildly elevated or slightly elevated in a patient with BPH. PSA is usually a marker for cancer, um, but it can be elevated by a lot of things. Like this picture shows, like if someone just has an, an enlarged prostate, it can be elevated. If their prostate is inflamed, if they have cancer, all of those could be possible reasons the PSA is elevated. Then on top of that, any sort of pressure on the prostate can also elevate it. So kind of think about this like a troponin, like when, when, um, when someone has an elevated troponin, it could be um, because they had a heart attack. It could also be because we did CPR on them, um, the literal pressure from them. So it's the same with the PSA, where if they've recently ejaculated, if they've recently had that digital rectal, rectal exam, where we've pressed on the prostate, even if they've done, um, they've recently ridden a bike, they could have an elevated PSA. So in other words, a PSA is not the most accurate, but we can use it with other tests. Um, and then if any of these are showing signs of possible issues, we can do a transrectal ultrasound and um, look at that too. Um, and like I mentioned too, we're worried about kidney function issues. So we might check um, kidney function or creatinine. So um, there are conservative management or surveillance of prostate issues. If it's caught early, we can start with dietary changes, avoid all those urinary irritants, um, caffeine, alcohol, carbonated drinks, spicy acidic foods. Um, also, your book talks about cold uh, medication products like pseudoephedrine or pseudofed, um, phenylephrine, anything that has that in it can also irritate um, the, uh, what do you call it, um, urinary system or make DPH worse. So um, kind of avoiding those where possible. And we can also tell them to restrict their evening fluid intake so that they have less chance of that nocturia and then do things like timed voiding. Um, the rest of the, like if those aren't uh, enough on their own or we don't catch it as early, then um, all these medical treatments that we're about to talk about, um, what, of course, I would know they're working if they're able to urinate more easily, um, if they're able to, you know, have those decreased symptoms or less residuals and things like that, less retention. Um, so the two main meds that we use for BPH, the first one's called finasteride. Um, this also known as ProScar is the brand name. Um, this one is a prostate shrinker. It actually um, decreases the size of the prostate tissue. Uh, the, it sounds great because that's exactly what we're trying to do, but it can take, uh, your book talks about now, it doesn't say three to six months, it says six, up to six months. But um, it can, in other words, it takes a while for it to work to see results. Um, there is a risk of sexual dysfunction with this, or they can have, um, uh, what do you call it, issues with um, sexual arousal and um, getting an erection, things like that. Um, and then the other thing to consider with this med is, is that it does literally kill tissue. So it can um, be dangerous for anyone who's pregnant. So not obviously the patient, but for the um, nurse that's handling it, if you're pregnant, you need to um, be cautious. You're not really supposed to be handling this if you're pregnant. Um, it, it's kind of like using like chemotherapy precautions. Um, so that's one way that we can help is we can reduce the size of the prostate gland. In the meantime, we usually start them on something that will work a lot quicker, which is Tamsolus. And we've talked about this med over and over. It relaxes the smooth muscle in the urinary tract. Cool. The only downside is it is a cardiac med. So um, it lowers your blood pressure. So we want to watch that closely, tell them to change positions slowly. Um, your book has pages 
of surgical options. Um, and you do not need to know them all. I'm here to tell you, whoo, all right, breathe a little bit. So there's two I want you to know about. I want you to know about the prostatectomy and the TERP. Um, the, the TERP is the most common and then the prostatectomy is like the most invasive, but it is another possibility. So we're gonna talk about those two. So the TERP is the most common one you're gonna see done. And what this is, as excruciating as this may sound, um, they um, do it, uh, it's uh, like it's a transurethral procedure. So it's a, like it's, it's they go up through the urethra, they don't even have to open the patient and they literally scrape away the um, uh, prostate tissue to um, to make more space, to have like a more uh, more ability to flow. So you can kind of see in this picture where they come in and they scrape the excess tissue. So there's a better ability to flow. Um, the biggest risk here, of course, is we're scraping tissue so they can have bleeding and they also can have a lot of clot issues. We'll talk about how that's why we do the bladder irrigation. So after this procedure, they're going to be put on bladder irrigation, which we'll go more into. Um, but I'm effectively like, because they're going to like literally be like, it's kind of like, imagine like you had a scab and you scraped away and it's just going to be bleeding. This is the same kind of thing. Like, so we're going to rapidly irrigate their bladder. So clots don't get in. They have good urinary flow. Um, but what can happen is think about too, when we talked about enemas, how I said that you can um, accidentally absorb too much and you can have water intoxication. This is the same thing. So this is effectively where I'm putting all this water into the patient, like in I'm putting it in through their Foley catheter and just like cleaning out their bladder. But sometimes the body can absorb some of that irrigation fluid. And what happens is, is that in the bloodstream, you get too much water, not enough salt. And so we get hyponatremia. And when someone gets hyponatremia, they get really confused in their head. Um, they can get really restless and then they can end up having a lot of very serious life or death complications. So we just want to monitor. They can have seizures and other things. I want to put them on seizure precautions. We're going to usually put them on like 3% saline to slowly raise up that sodium because we need more sodium um, and they might be on a fluid restriction. So just know that we, we don't get too, too deep into this TERP syndrome, but just know they can get hyponatremia or low sodium um, by absorbing too much of that irrigation fluid. Um, more invasively, they can do what's called an open prostatectomy. Um, and this is for men that have more complicated cases. It's an external incision so they can view the entire prostate um, and um, remove and uh, what do you call it, what they need to. So it's not the scraping, it's where they're actually removing um, the uh, the. I don't even know if they remove all or just part of it, but yes, yeah, so they're removing the prostate um, to remove the obstruction. Um, the other issue with this is that because they're cutting through tissue, we're cutting through nerves. So there's a higher chance of erectile dysfunction afterward. Um, there's also, um, you know, it's open. So there's more risk of for infection um, with this patient than there might be with the TERP and then bleeding and pain, of course, um, because it is a, a pretty uh, painful procedure where they're opening. So let's do a question. A nurse is caring for a client following a transurethral resection of the prostate, also known as a TERP, which assessment finding would warrant an immediate call to the physician? So um, this is usually a question where we're going to have answer choices that are things that are expected but might sound scary or things that are not expected and are a problem. So the first one says client complains of intermittent bladder spasms. So already looking at this one, I see the word intermittent and usually, not always, usually the word intermittent is okay. Like it's less scary. It's not constant, continuous, anything like that. Intermittent can be okay. So, um, so far that one, there's no red flags there for me. Clients, urine color is light pink with occasional clots. So again, that word occasional, it's like intermittent. Um, I like that the color is light pink. After the surgery, we really, we're going to like titrate their irrigation fluid to get it where their urine color is light pink. So I think this is actually something we would want, um, you know, for this patient. Client has 3000 milliliters of urine out in the past few hours. Well, that's a lot of urine. But we have to remember here that it's not actually urine that's coming out. What else are we getting out? We're getting urine and we're getting the irrigation fluid. So this is actually probably, um, you know, it depends, like I always need to know their I's and their O's. So a lot of times we want to look at like, what is what going is, what is that? Let me say, if I can say this is what that is getting put in coming out. So um, we might look at that, but having that much urine output, they can have that much out if that's the irrigation that we're putting in. Um, so nothing like that. I'm like, Ooh, that's too much. Um, client has been harder to wake up since your first assessment. So this could be a sign of 
that hyponatremia, that Terp syndrome. So um, if they're having a change in level of consciousness, um, a change in mental status, confusion, things like that, that's going to be a ding, ding, ding. Like there's a, for A, B, and C, there's reasons that make sense um, that aren't scary that could explain A, B, and C. There's nothing to explain. There's no reason for a patient to be harder to wake up or harder to arouse. Um, uh, since your first assessment that like that's not expected it's not like then after the first uh, phase then they'll get sleepy like patients shouldn't be getting sleepy change in level of consciousness is usually a pretty um pretty significant change we want to do something about so d is the correct answer so post-op, I'm going to be managing complications. There's lots of bleeding that can happen with these patients. So I want to be super careful um, watching um, their, uh, like pretty much I want to watch, watch the color of their urine, how much they're getting out, um, any signs of anemia, hypotension, that kind of stuff. I'm going to look for those changes. Um, bladder spasms, we can give them medications for that. If a patient has... Um, a bladder spasm, I'll talk about this more on the next page. Um, it can be expected, but if they're having them frequently, it can be from like clots and stuff. So sometimes I need to make sure my irrigation is working and there's no obstruction. Um, we'll talk more about that on the next one. But um, incontinence is another possibility, especially after they get their Foley removed. It can take up to 12 months to achieve continence. So I'm just telling them, especially after they get their Foley out, that it might take some time and doing Kegels can be really helpful. Um, infection, I'm just kind of monitoring for that and trying to prevent that. I'm going to be managing that catheter. So make sure to review how we take care of a catheter, prevent infection, just daily nursing care where I keep the catheter, et cetera. I'll be managing their bladder irrigation, um, which I'll talk about on the next slide. And then I don't want them doing any straining. So I don't want them to get constipated and be straining. I don't want them to be lifting anything. I don't want them to be staying in the same position for too long, sitting for too long, standing for too long, et cetera. Um, and then of course, those eyes and nose are going to be key. I want them to be as balanced as possible because um, I don't want them to be absorbed absorbing too much of that irrigation fluid. So, and I, well, I guess I'll talk about this one. So um, the purpose of this continuous bladder irrigation, again, is for stuff like the TERP procedure. I need to clear out excess blood and promote good urinary output. Um, so I'm trying to flush things out, get them um, clear so that this patient can um, uh, what do you call it? Um, not get obstructed, have good flow. I'm not having any retention. Um, and um, what do you call it? Um, not have any issues uh, with the, now that they have this prostate that's been scraped. You know, we need to keep everything like clear and free. We don't want them bleeding. So my role as a whole is to assess the patency of the catheter. So of course, I'm going to assess the patency. I can look at it and see if there's urine flowing from it. That's great. Um, I want to assess the color of the urine. Like I mentioned, we're going to titrate the, um, there's this, so you can kind of see it here. There's these irrigation bags. They connect directly to my Foley bag. And what I do is, is that they're like 3000 milliliter bags. And I literally will um, like increase their flow or decrease their flow, depending on what color my urine is. I want my urine to be light pink. Pink and, um, you know, eventually it will become clear, but light pink in the first couple of days is pretty normal. If it starts to get red, bright red, um, it could be a clot has gotten dislodged or it could be that I need more irrigation. So I definitely just want to keep an eye on that. Um, I need to regularly empty the Foley. These are really big bags. So sometimes like you might have to be in there every couple hours to empty that Foley catheter bag. It can seem like a pain in the butt, but it's good that they're getting good output. Um, like I mentioned, what goes in should come out. So keeping a really close eye. So you as the nurse need to know, okay, this is how much has gone in. This is how much has come out. And, and is it matching like where it should? Because um, generally like whatever irrigation that I'm putting in should be coming out. And then how I get their actual urine output is, is subtracting that. So for example, if I'm putting in, let's say in the last hour, I've put a thousand into the patient of irrigation um, and then they put out 1250, then the 250 is their actual urine output for that hour. So you have to always kind of, you have to subtract and calculate um, to see what their actual um, output was. Um, and then they might need antispasmodics, like the bladder is just very sensitive. It has all these clots and all these changes and all that um, irrigation flowing in can cause irritation. So they may need antispasmodics, but if a patient has um, is having a lot of spasms um, or any signs of obstruction, the first thing we want to do is look for kinks. Kinks can happen in the Foley catheter. Kinks can happen within the patient. Um, but, um, and what I mean by that, the tubing and stuff can get kinks. So we always want to be looking for anything obvious to relieve the obstruction first. So 
my first thing, like, you know, a patient's having a bladder spasm. First thing I want to do is, is, um, uh, what do you call it? Yes. I'm probably going to get them some meds, but I want to check the catheter and make sure it's flowing. Okay. First, um, like I mentioned, pink urine is expected for 24 to 4, 36 hours. Um, and then after that time, there should like pink urine with some occasional clots. Um, after that time, there should be no clots. Um, it should be cleared out by then. And then a sign of a problem, um, the blood clots after the 24 to 36 hours, bright red blood could be a sign of a hemorrhage. Or if there's sudden intense spasms, I should look for obstructions. And I shouldn't say like, if you have any, uh, like just a mild spasm, it, it, you shouldn't be like, if they're like, oh, you came in and they're like, oh, I had a spasm. And you're like, oh my God, let me check for obstruction. But if they have a sudden intense spasm, you should be checking for obstruction in their um, catheter bag. Overall general edu uh, nursing care for BPH. Um, we talked about this with, um, I want to say UTIs or retention or things like that, um, you know, but conducive environment for urination, privacy, whatever we can do. If like a lot of times for men, it helps them to stand up. So whatever, if it's safe, um, making sure that we can provide them with as much privacy, dignity, and um, comfort in their urinary experience, um, urinating every two to three hours. And then also another two to three, two to three liters of fluid a day. Um, but remember, this is just like urinary retention, where I don't want them to be taking too much um, at one time. So we want to spread it throughout the day um, and not too much at night, remember, because we don't want them to have that knock cherry as much. Um, counseling for sexual function changes. Um, this might not seem like a big deal, but it is a big deal for, um, for men. And so you want to kind of keep in mind that, you know, when you're giving these meds that can affect their sexual function, you might be saying like, man, you need to pee. You can't get urinary retention, but like, this is something really important. So there are other things and other ways that we can work with them and hopefully find a way to, um, maintain, restore their sexual function while still helping with their underlying process. Um, so just know there's medications, therapy, counseling, and sex therapists, all the fun stuff. So want to refer them and let them know they're not alone in that and that they can speak to you about that. Um, kegels to strengthen the urinary muscles, especially it's going to help because when they first get these procedures, they might still be having some incontinence. So just in um, supporting really uh, good, strong muscles there, uh, preventing constipation. We do not want them heavy, lifty, heavy lifting or straining. Um, and then of course, avoiding our bladder irritants, which are alcohol, caffeine, citrus juices, et cetera, chocolates, all the good things in life. Mm. I think that's it. Guys, it's been a pleasure. Um, I, I know, I'm trying not to sound too happy. Again, I love you all. And I would, no, I'm, I'm trying to think of a good analogy because I'm generally a pretty fearful person. I'm not like an, I'm adventurous, but just in my own way. Um, but um, I, I teach nursing school. That's my adventure. <laughs> just kidding. Um, but um, yeah, needless to say, uh, I, I would, do, I will continue to do many things for y'all, but I am very happy to be signing off since I'm losing my voice anyway, <laughs> I need to be able to teach this lecture by Thursday. So I will see you guys soon. Let me know how else I can help. Have a great day.